Welcome back, everyone, to the Chaos Ball Podcast. Thanks for tapping in right off the bat. Three of the manners are growing mustaches right now. Uh, Scott Service is growing a mustache. Logan Gilbert grew a mustache. Kyle Rowley grew a mustache. How many more mustaches will there be? Will the Mariners lead the league in mustaches per... I was going to say per capita, but that doesn't make sense. Mustaches in the clubhouse. I wanted to point this out. One, because I'm titling the episode, The Mariners Mustache Men. And two, I went to San Diego last week to see the Mariners play. It was a midweek game. It was on Tuesday. I was on the field for batting practice right by the Mariners dugout. I saw all of the Mariners go out of the dugout, come back in the dugout during the game. Or not during the game, before the game when they were warming up. And I I posted a photo of myself with Julio Rodriguez on my Twitter account. I have a mustache. None of the Mariners at that point had a mustache. And then all of a sudden, the next week... There's three guys on the team growing a mustache. Hmm, just just very curious, very very curious. Wondering how uh, how that came about. So that's that's all I wanted to say on that matter. And before I before I move on, there was a funny quote about this. And no, I don't. I'm not that self involved. I don't think they all grew mustaches because they saw my mustache. But they did though. Uh, but no, the the quote the, the quote that came out after we the fans kind of saw these mustaches because we saw Logan's first and then Cal grew one, and Cal uh, was shit talking Logan's a little bit. He he said I have a better one than Logan. I already told him that. I said there's a new sheriff in town with a mustache. He's a little behind. His his looks like a dirty little teenager mustache, which is hilarious to say. Cal's mustache is pretty good. It kind of leads into his goatee. And, like, Logan Gilbert had the goatee before and then uh, was, would just shave the, the the bottom half of the goatee, and that just creates a mustache. I don't hate Logan's mustache. It looks more like mine than, than Cal's, so I feel like Cal would probably call that mine a little, little dirty little teen mustache. It was just funny. It's funny. Those dudes are roommates all throughout the minors, too, so they're clearly very good homies, and, uh... The homies are growing mustaches, and then Scott Service has, it's he's cropping up too in honor of them. So the mustaches are in full force, and if that turns the season around, then I'm all for it. It might turn the season around. That's mustache camaraderie. But enough with mustache talk. Let's get into the pod. What do we got today? We got some chaos. We have some baseball reference, a special baseball reference edition yet again. And uh, the Mariners did play some baseball the past week, actually pretty good baseball. I'll talk about that. I'll talk about uh, the reverse boycott that the A's had, if you didn't see. That was fun. I'll touch on that. And also, I'll touch on why I think uh, the NL Central is the most interesting division in baseball. But enough of all this. Let's get to the chaos moment of the week. Yes, it's not a weekly thing. When I see something come across my timeline, and feel like talking about it, and it was rather chaotic. Because, you know, there are a lot of chaotic moments in baseball, but there's some that that set set itself apart from the others from the pack. And this one this week, this happened uh, a couple of days ago, depending on when you're listening to this. It was on Friday of last week. So the 16th of June, if uh whenever you're listening to this, 16th of June, Dodgers Giants Friday night. And it, this was a crazy chaotic game, and I was watching this the whole time and following the Mariners on MLB at bat because even with my prowess of finding the Mariners illegally to watch out of network, couldn't even find it, find the Apple stream for uh, illegal, illegally, and I don't have Apple TV, so I wasn't able to watch that game. So I was following that on the at bat app and watching Dodgers Giants instead because it was on national TV. And what a fun game this was, first of all. It goes to extras after the Giants are getting no hit for six innings from a uh, pitcher making his debut, and then they go to tie the game. They go to extra innings. I I could make a whole segment of chaos on just the last, like, four innings of this game because it was just the stupidest, drunkest, late-night NL West baseball game I can remember in a while. And this play sums it up perfectly. If you if you've if you watch this play, you probably know what I'm talking about. But I'm gonna I'm just gonna watch it right now. I'm gonna watch it back. So Mookie Betts, he hits a pop up. 
And this is and this is with a, a man on second and one out. The Dodgers are down two in the bottom of the eleventh. So, you know, this is kind of a crucial bat. You got the guy you want up at the plate with Mookie. To, he's the tying run. He pops it up. He pops up the pitch from Jacob Junis on a two-two count. It's going straight up, right by the mound. Casey Smith from third dives in, and is calling it. He's got it. Oh, he dropped it. He drops it. It goes right to Jacob Junis, the pitcher, flat-footed. Yosses it to first, if at least five feet over the first baseman's head. Down the first baseline it goes, and it's retrieved by Mike Yastrzemski, the right fielder. And then at this point, I'm going to pause it. At this point, you're like, oh, wow, okay, so the Dodgers have some cooking now. It's second and third, one out in the bottom of the 11th. No, absolutely not. You see Mike Yastrzemski realize what is happening. There's runner. The runners are caught. Now, Mookie Betts had ran to third and didn't realize that the the runner had stopped at third. So basically, Mookie just wasn't paying attention and didn't realize that he wasn't going home. And so when he was running to third, he got caught between second and third, and then the other runner got caught between home and third. They tagged the guy who who was going to going to home out. Mookie makes it to third base. This play, I watched it. I've watched it back. I still can't believe all the stuff that happened. Because even this play where Casey Smith drops a pop-up in the infield, Jacob Junis throws it, one of the worst throws I've ever seen, uh, to first base over the guy's head. And that's where you think the play ends. And no, there's just so much more stuff that goes on in this play. And the Dodgers end up losing this game. They 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 make an extra out because then it's just one a man on third with two outs. If there was second and third with one out for the Dodgers, I bet they would have tied the game up probably or won. But instead, they get in a in a pickle and make an out they didn't need to. And honestly, it was kind of on Mookie Betts. Uh, this it was kind of a, it was just straight out of a little league playbook. This play it was fantastic. I loved watching it. And if you can find the radio broadcast, because. Both the TV broadcasts were good. I like both the Giants and the Dodgers crews as well, but they're good and all. But that's what the assumption that people are watching while they're listening to them announce. The radio guys, obviously, they have to describe everything that's happening to anyone listening on radio because they're not watching the game. And it was just a mouthful. You heard me just try to explain it, and I was watching the game. That's why I'm not an announcer. The radio broadcast was insane. It was awesome. Uh, and then the the last thing I'll say about this particular chaotic moment is the MLB at bat summary of this play is field error and I'll just read this long paragraph to you because most of the time this stuff is like like the one right below this to end the game Freddie Freeman strikes out swinging or blank grounds out to blank this one is Mookie Betts reaches on a fielding error by third baseman Casey Smith Mookie Betts to third Throwing error by pitcher Jacob Junis. Michael Bush out at home on the throw. Right fielder Mike Yastrzemski to shortstop Brandon Crawford to second baseman Tyro Estrada to catcher Patrick Bailey to pitcher Jacob Junis. Mookie bets to third. Two outs. That if, if you were just following along on that app, you'd have no clue what just happened. And will be a bat for as as good as they've made that app. Had, there's no way they were going to be able to explain that one correctly. There's just simply no way. And so that was a chaotic moment of the week. That was that was pretty fun. Go look that play up if you if you haven't seen it. It was fantastic. But moving on to the uh, the important message of today's episode, it's Negro Leagues Appreciation Like Weekend in in uh, Major League Baseball. It was this past weekend. Our Seattle Mayors, we saw them rocking the Seattle Steelheads uh, Negro Leagues jerseys on Saturday, which is pretty sweet. I'm a big fan of those, and I honestly think they should have those just as an alternate. I think every team, if they had uh, Negro Leagues history in the city they play baseball, which most MLB teams have that history in the city, they should have those jerseys on their alternates. They should wear them a few times a year. Uh, at least every team should wear them during, like, around this time of year with Negro Leagues Appreciation Weekend, which coincides with Juneteenth, which is today when I'm recording. But it's uh, it, was a, it was a fun fun weekend, just great to see those jerseys. But for the Baseball Reference Point of the Week, 
I felt like I, I needed to pick a Negro Leagues player just to to honor some of some of the game's greatest players who who are in the Negro Leagues, and there are plenty of great Negro Leagues legends uh, to choose from here. A lot of a lot of uh, a lot of them fit under my sort of aesthetic for these baseball reference players of the week, which are, with a fun name. But then you, I mean, you got Satchel Page. Obviously, I could do I could talk ad nauseum about Satchel Page, like Buck Leonard. Uh, Josh Gibson, Rube Foster. I, there's a lot of amazing, amazing uh, baseball players from the Negro Leagues who never played in the major leagues. Uh, they, if they were just pre-integration, and we should appreciate them. And I'm glad that uh, we're getting to a point now where we can appreciate them more in the mainstream of baseball. It's been pretty awesome the past decade to see the, the growth of Negro League's awareness throughout the, the modern game. Uh, and there, there's a lot of good names on here, but who I'm going to choose, and this is this is a trifold name here. Uh, it satisfies three requirements. One, it's a cool name from baseball reference. Two, it's a player from the Negro Leagues to honor... Negro Leagues Appreciation Weekend. And three, it's Sneaky Honors Father's Day, which was on Sunday as well. This player's name is James Thomas Bell, otherwise known as Cool Papa Bell. Cool Papa Bell. He's in the Hall of Fame. Absolute Negro Leagues legend. This guy, Cool Papa Bell. He is absolutely, without a doubt, one of the greatest players to ever grace the Negro Leagues, and I, I had heard of him before, but I feel like when you when you bring up the Negro Leagues and who are the best players who have played, there's a lot who like Satchel Page is probably the one that comes to most people's minds. Might be the goat, Rube Foster for for a lot of reasons. He started the official Negro National League. Uh, there's a lot of names that come up, and when you think of Negro Leagues and integration, you think of Jackie Robinson, obviously, and a lot of a lot of guys like that. But cool, Papa Bell. Sneaky, one of the greatest players of all time to ever play in the Negro Leagues. He played a very long time, too. He played 21 years in the Negro Leagues, uh, four seasons in Black Baseball League, or Leagues, and four um, four seasons in Mexico, too, in Indie Ball, uh, which was right around the time Mexico integrated in 1938. Between 1941, they, they integrated baseball around that time, and he went down there to play after... Um, his uh, his you know, his Negro League career was winding down. He had a very very decorated career, as I said, eight time All Star. He won the Negro League World Series twice. He is in the Hall of Fame, inducted by the Negro League's committee. He's in the Washington Nationals Ring of Honor. Lifetime batting average of three twenty five, fifty seven home runs, fifteen hundred hits, almost six hundred RBIs. But really, his his best attribute as a player. Besides how good of a person he was, was his speed. Uh, he has been considered, or is considered, one of the fastest men to ever play the game of baseball. Period. Not just in the Negro Leagues, the game of baseball. There's stories aplenty about his speed, and he has been been decorated for that. Uh, but interesting, interesting backstory. How did he get into baseball? Cool Papa Bell. Well. At the age of 17, he moves to St. Louis to live with his brothers and go to high school. And rather than attending night school as planned, he spent most of his time playing baseball in the neighborhood. He actually, he's an outfielder in his career, but he signed initially for his first team as a knuckleball pitcher with the Compton Hill Cubs, which was a semi-pro black baseball team. Uh, They disbanded in 1921. And he played with them mostly on Sundays and holidays while he worked at a packing company during the week. And then when that club disbanded in 1922, he moved to the East St. Louis Cubs, which was another semi-pro team. And he made $20 weekly to pitch on Sundays for him. So that's how his baseball career got started. And then he joined in 1922, later that year, the Negro National League with the St. Louis Stars. And he earned his nickname in his first season. He was referred to as Cool after striking out... uh, Oscar Charleston, which another Negro League goat, Oscar Charleston, he, tr- he struck him out. So people were like, oh, this guy's cool. Let's call him cool. Very inventive. And added uh, Papa to the nickname because it sounded better, I guess. Like, so they, could, they couldn't just call him Cool Bell. Cool Papa Bell sounded better, which honestly I agree with. I agree with. It was a good addition, Cool Papa Bell. 
He made occasional appearances in the outfield, apparently, while he was pitching. And by 1924, so two years into his career in the Negro Leagues, he began working on his defensive skill and appearing more in the outfield. And it was at the, the urge of the, his manager, Bill Gatewood, at the time, basically was like, you need to make a permanent move to the outfield. And so he stopped pitching, made a permanent move to center field, and he, you know, he played in all outfield positions, but his main position was center field. But his... And, and he was already a great outfielder. He didn't have a great throwing arm, but he was so fast. Like I mentioned, he was so electric out there in the field. And his speed was well known, obviously. There's there's so many stories about him, but he, like, there's stories of pitchers. They would try to stop, try to not issue walks against him aggressively. Like, they would pitch him a lot in the zone because he was basically, if he got on, they said, like, he's just going to probably steal second and third and probably score on the next play. Uh, he could sometimes score a run if he was on first base and the batter got a hit, it's described. You know, it, it's interesting, the, the history of of Negro Leagues, because they, they played a very different type of baseball. It's quoted here that we played a different kind of baseball than the white teams. We played tricky baseball. We did things they didn't expect. We bunt and run in the first inning. That's when they would come in for a bunch and we'd hit away. we always cross them up. We'd run the bases hard and make the fielders throw too quick and make wild throws. We'd fake a steal home and rattle the pitcher into a balk. Really interesting stuff because they, they often, Negro Leagues players, would play against uh, the white teams as well. And it's just so interesting the stark contrast of uh, the styles of Negro Leagues versus the the major leagues at the time, which was, was white only. Uh, but he, he had a very stored career. There's, there's other things to highlight in his career. I mean, like I said, he won two Negro leagues, world championships back to back years, both with, uh, the Homestead grays who actually super interesting. The minor story behind those, like I said, he played in the Negro leagues for a long time. He played up until, Let's see, it's right in front of me. 1937 in the Negro Leagues and also Black Baseball Leagues as well simultaneously. And then he went to Mexico for those four years, four seasons. And then he came back to the Negro Leagues, and that's when he won those World Series. So his first stead in the Negro Leagues, he was a great player, eight, you know, eight-time All-Star. But then he came back and was basically just as good and won two rings with the Homestead Grace, which... Super, super story to Homestead Grace teams as well. Really, really just, I mean, some of the greatest players of all time have played for the Homestead Grays. Like, I know Rube Foster did. I know Josh Gibson did. Buck Leonard, Cumberland Posey, Smokey Joe Williams. There's there's plenty of guys on that list of, of Homestead Gray alumni that I might do a baseball reference for the week on. But that's it. The segment's running long. But I wanted to honor Cool Papa Bell because now when you think of the Negro Leagues, you can think of Satchel Page and all the other great guys, and Cool Papa Bell's got to come up. He has to come up in your mind when you're thinking about this because uh, some of the best parts of the game of baseball is not actually playing the game of baseball, but it's how they conducted themselves off the field. Uh, I mean, he it's it's on his Wikipedia page, but his legacy is, is a really big one, is a really big legacy and very storied legacy from Cool Papa Bell. One of his former teammates, for example, Ted Page, had commented on the clean off-the-field lifestyle that Bell lived. He said that Bell was, quote, an even better man off the field than he was on it. He was honest. He was kind. He was a clean liver. In fact, in all the years I've known him, I've never seen him smoke, take a drink, or even say one cuss word, end quote. Just great guy. Great all-around guy. And it's it's interesting for the time period to not to be so, I mean, for lack of a better term, pure, I guess, because the time period, I mean, dudes were smoking in the clubhouse and drinking in the clubhouse. Like people, a lot of these players died young for a good reason, uh, but not cool Papa Bell. Apparently a very nice dude, lived to be 87 as well, lived a very long life, 1903 to 1991. He unfortunately died suddenly of a heart attack in 1991, uh, and his... His wife had died a few weeks earlier, and it's not confirmed, but it's linked. Like, you know, it's kind of that that's how it goes sometimes. You know, his his wife dies, and he dies of a heart attack a couple weeks later. Sad, but almost poetic, and they're together They're together now. So, good to think about. He There's a street named after him where he used to live. He's inducted in the St. Louis uh, Walk of Fame. 
Uh, he's in the Mississippi Sports Hall of Fame. He was born in Starkville, Mississippi, which is where Mississippi State is. There is a lot of references to him. There's been uh, he's been mentioned in books. I know he was mentioned in Ken Burns Ken Burns baseball as well. And the St. Louis Cardinals actually recognize his contributions. And there's a statue of him outside of Bush Stadium with other Hall of Famers of St. Louis baseball stars like Stan Musial, Lou Brock, Bob Gibson. Cool Papa Bell is out there with them. So maybe if you're a Cardinals fan and found your way listening to this segment somehow, you might know who he is. But that's Cool Papa Bell. That's Cool Papa Bell. Shout out to him. Shout out to all the great Negro League players. And uh, it was a good weekend. I I can encourage you, if you haven't, to really go read, watch, video, whatever on the Negro Leagues. They're really fascinating. Baseball pre-integration was super, super cool in a lot of different ways. Uh, And I think people focus on the 1920s Yankees of it all and and all that. And that's, that's cool. But... There's even even better stories that come out of like black baseball and Negro leagues and like independent like Mexico leagues and South America was really interesting and Central America was really interesting at the time baseball wise so weird era but very cool that we're finally honoring a bunch of these guys so that was cool Papa Bell and that was the baseball reference player of the week and now we can get into modern baseball shall we let's talk about you know let's talk about the A's let's talk about the freaking A's shout out to A's fans. And just the city of Oakland in general, you know, I feel like the baseball world is collectively trying to sympathize. Some can probably empathize with losing a team. I cannot empathize with losing a baseball team. Uh, but, you know, I think everyone's kind of come together and been like, you know, Oakland fans exist. A's fans exist. The reverse boycott showed this. Uh, it was kind of very sad and really cool all at the same time. They were all wearing shirts that said sell. They were chanting sell the team during the game. The The crowd ended up being almost 28,000, which is basically sold out for the Coliseum. I mean, the Coliseum can hold a lot, but they don't really sell like the tickets in the top bowl. They haven't in a long time because they just don't really have the facilities or staff to keep that up, even if they did sell those tickets, I'm pretty sure. Like, I don't think they're allowed to sell those tickets right now. So 28,000 was basically filling the stadium as they could fill it. And boy, was it loud. If you watch that game, and I was watching it while watching the Mariners game, it was awesome to see. It was like, in a, it was like a playoff game. Like, Brent Rooker had a tying double in the eighth inning, I think, of that game, and it sounded like a playoff game. It was, it was sweet. It was, and it was bittersweet. It was awesome to see Oakland fans come out and uh, especially support the players. Like, the players are still playing. They're professionals. They're trying to win. And that was probably awesome for the players. I mean, at at a point when they when the fans collectively started chanting, sell the team, it was so loud, uh, the pitcher couldn't hear his pitch calm. And Shea Langoliers, as a catcher, was walking out to him because they had to call time to fix it. And he was he couldn't help but he had a grin on his face. He knew how awesome this was. Because obviously the players can't come out and criticize the team. They can't come out and say much about what's happening. But clear, obviously they probably enjoyed that. Especially playing in front of such a huge crowd. Uh, and Oakland fans were, were awesome. And they won. It coincided with an A's eight-game winning streak in which they beat the Rays twice in a series, the best team in baseball. It was, like, how can you not be romantic about baseball? Like, that reverse boycott coincides with a win streak to to pull your team out from the bottom of MLB and tie the Royals for the worst record, all simultaneously while, like, the Nevada legislature is voting to approve the, the stadium costs and stuff. It's just, it's sad and cool. It just it's a reminder that what is happening is an absolute crime and that Oakland is a good baseball market. There's not even good business sense. Like there's not a good like oh it's a small market it can't support a baseball team. It's been supporting the A's for a very very long time. I mean you go back to the 70s they were like the high, one of the higher payroll teams. They were one of the greatest attended teams in the league. Even you go back to the 2000s even early 2010s when that team was pretty good and made the playoffs, they were averaging good crowds. They were averaging some payroll more than right now. It's just crazy to me that they're not even veiling it anymore. MLB, John Fisher, they're just like, no, it's it's all about John Fisher. It's all about him needing to get out of there because they were going to try to make him pay for the stadium. You know, it's just it just stinks. 
And there were some nerds on the internet trying to say, like, why give money to the owner if you're protesting? And I just, I don't really understand those people. Like, this sent a great message. And to quote uh, the inspiration for this podcast, Heath Ledger's Joker, it's not about the money. It's about the message. And it is. It was really about the message. And even if you're worried about giving money to the owner or the team, they is kind of dunked on themselves. After, after, like, during this game, they said they were donating the game revenue to two charities. I think it was uh, Alameda County Food Community Food Bank and Oakland Public Education Fund, which is cool. Love that. Big fan of MLB teams giving back to the communities in which they operate their business. I think that's wonderful. There should be more of that. I mean, teams do a pretty good job of it. Uh, but they announced that the game revenue, over $800,000 in revenue, was being donated to these two charities. And it's like, okay, so if you support or invest in the team and get fans to come out, like that is your game revenue for the poorest, quote, poorest team in the league. And you can't invest in the team enough to run it, to make a profit and build a new stadium in Oakland. Like it was kind of a dunk on themselves. Like, letting everyone know that's how much revenue you can make on one game. And, of course, it's just revenue. It's not profit. But, like, you see what happens when all these fans come out. You see how much money you can make if you're just concerned about money, which is all John Fisher is concerned about. It's just really frustrating. And, again, the, the crux of this issue has been the excuse, at least, is John Fisher, this, this owner of this team, is like, Oakland won't approve a new stadium. They won't give me a new stadium. And I, and I just, if you sympathize with him, I don't know how you can live your life. It's not even that John Fisher bought the team. He's the heir to the gap fortune and was given this team. He's, he's a Nepo baby. He's a Nepo baseball baby. He's a Nepo gap baby. And he is ruining baseball as we know it in Oakland, which is a great market for baseball. And to make matters worse... Rob Manfred at a press conference that usually makes matters worse most of the time whenever he has a press conference he's the king of he just can't speak publicly without shitting on himself and and alienating groups of people in the game I mean I'm not going to talk about what he said about pride I could get into that it was that was something else and and out of context his quotes always look worse than in, if they are in real life because People know this guy has no empathy at all. But the quote that really made the rounds was he was asked to comment on the reverse boycott. And he said, quote, I mean, it was great. It was great to see what is this year almost an average Major League Baseball crowd in the facility for one night. That's a great thing. What a dickhead. Are you kidding? Like, out of context... And uh, there's not much context, I guess, out of context of not being in the press conference. So I heard someone who was at the press conference say he was kind of joking. But again, if Rod Manfred tries to joke, it doesn't come off as a joke because he's not funny. Nor does he know how to speak and make it seem like a joke. He has one tone. And the, the tough part is most of the people seeing this quote aren't going to be in the press room to hear his voice or even watch the video of him saying this stuff. They're going to read it. And reading it makes it look so much worse. And reading it, it might be one of the worst quotes to come out of the Manfred era, and that's saying a lot. There's talking down, actively talking down to Oakland A's fans and just treating them like garbage and not appreciating what we just saw in a show of defiance to a greedy owner trying to move the team away from the city that they live in and the team that they love trying to move it. It's and Manfred's like, oh, oh, good job. Oh, you, oh, you amassed a a cool average baseball crowd. Okay, shut up, Rob. That was also uh, ta the second biggest crowd the Rays have faced this or uh, not faced had this year at their home stadium, which is pretty funny. Rob Manfred just sucks. Uh, it's all that. And the press conference coupled with Rob basically just letting the A's and John Fisher dismantle the team. I shouldn't say the A's. Letting John Fisher dismantle the team and be allowed to just leave for a new city that'll build a stadium off the back of taxpayer money. The precedent he's setting is dangerous. If he continues to be a, 
like he continues to be a really good commissioner for the owners, but I can't fathom how the owners think this is an okay thing that you can actively tank the team, not invest in it and have an excuse to just move and have a stadium given to you. Like that's a very dangerous precedent that I'm sure many owners would do. I'm looking at the Milwaukee Brewers. Like what if they just decide to blow everything up blame it on low attendance, and then move out of Milwaukee. That is basically what Rob Manfred is saying is okay to do in this modern era of baseball. He just he continues to be a great commissioner for the owners, terrible, terrible commissioner for the players, for the fans, terrible public speaker, always has been, never shown any empathy, any remorse, joy, any joy, anything. He just peddles the owner's shit and makes excuses about things being for the players. Like, he doesn't like baseball. He simply doesn't like baseball, and I think it's rather emblematic of the owners, because I don't think a lot of owners like baseball. I think owners look at it as a revenue stream, and you can't if you're a sports owner. That's not how it works. You have millions of fans to answer to. And also, John Fisher can just decline the press conferences. He should have to answer for his crimes. He can just say, no, I'm not going to the press conference. And that, I think, is really dumb as well. And also Rob Manfred, to piggyback on all of this, he said that the A's city, the city of Oakland didn't have a proposal even close to approval for a new stadium. And that's a straight up lie that was exposed immediately after uh, people part of that whole process. They had gone through a lot of steps to get a stadium approved, and they were actually pretty close in the last couple of weeks, right before they announced uh, that it got approved through the Nevada legislature because they were basically pushing it as hard as they possibly could to go through, maybe because before Oakland was going to get papers together to build a new stadium. Manfred straight up lied in that interview saying Oakland had no proposal on the table. The city of Oakland said, fuck no, we had a very good proposal. It was close. It was getting there. And with more time, maybe it could have been approved by the end of this year. It's really complicated, but it's the sad part is this has been rushed because they just want to leave as quick as possible. They want to leave a very good baseball market to build a shiny new stadium off taxpayer money in Nevada that they'll end up paying for for 20 years probably. And in a, in a smaller market with the same owner who probably still won't invest that much in the team with a stadium that will be really expensive because it needs to have a roof because it's in Las Vegas in a summer sport. None of this makes sense, and I can't believe Rob Manfred is allowing it to happen. Oh, just frustrating. Just wildly frustrating. But that was my A's rant. Really cool, though. Really cool. I think it was great to see the A's fans rally together like that and, and chant sell the team. It just stinks because, obviously, John Fisher doesn't give a shit. John Fisher probably didn't even watch the game. People were like, oh, they're chanting sell the team. He's probably laughing. Just like, oh, okay, yeah, yeah, we'll sell the team. Man, fuck that guy. All right, let's get into Mariners baseball. Mariners baseball actually making me kind of happy the past week. You know, the season's a roller coaster. There's a lot of good stuff to come out from this week. Really encouraging stuff. They had the, the good home stand against the Marlins, the Fish, and the White Sox. They take two of three from both. So they go four and two in the home stand. They're back at 500 where they love to hover around. Those first two Marlins games were great. They won 8-1. They won 9-3. Great pitching. Great hitting. Offense really came alive. And then on Wednesday, the 14th, they lost 4-1 to the Marlins in the game of warning track outs. I think in the first three innings, there were like five deep warning track outs that the Mariners made. And then Solaire hits a wall scraper for... Uh, like not like after those those Mariners hits, and, and that's when I turned the game off. No, I'm just kidding. I had to leave midway through this game, and they ended up losing, so they didn't complete the sweep, but the vibes were still high going into the White Sox series, and they take two of three from the White Sox. Really, they should have swept them. They won on Friday, which was a very, these were all very close games too, and the White Sox are not a very good team, which was a little frustrating, but what was good was we saw a lot of good stuff. A lot of good stuff from these series. Uh, the the Marlins series, like most of the people contributed. Most of the homies in the lineup contributed. The pitching looked great. I think that 
I don't know what even happened. It was in Seattle. I mean, they're all, they just looked better. I mean, the Marlins pitching staff is a little raw. They're a little young, and I think they got to them. And I think they had a good game plan going into the game. It was it was really refreshing actually to to watch the lineup go th- watch us go through the lineup with a pretty clear game plan of how to attack each pitcher they had, which was really refreshing to watch. And really, it was more it was more of the same from the pitching staff. Monday's game, Bryce Miller, great game. Tuesday's game, George Kirby. I cannot talk enough about this dude. He's so good. He's awesome to watch. Every time he takes the mound, I am just gleeful that he's on my baseball team and I get to to root for him every five days. He goes six innings, three hits, one run, not even earned, and ten strikeouts. Career high in strikeouts. Looked fantastic. Diced up their whole team. Just great. Just great stuff from the young the young pitching staff. And then it was weird. The Wednesday game was weird. I, I, I mentioned the warning track shots. That was like when I felt the game was just, we were just going to lose no matter what because you hit three warning track outs in two innings and it's like, well, okay. The vibes aren't good. Things are probably not going to go well. And they didn't. Luis Castillo had a weird start. He went five and two thirds, gave up two earned runs, only two hits, Six strikeouts, but six walks. The guy, it it's it's start to start with how his command's gonna be, and you know there is a baseline for his production, which is good. Like there's a good floor because his stuff is so good. His his floor for a bad start is gonna be a little bit better than a lot of other people, just because his stuff is that nasty. But his command this year has just been very iffy on a lot of starts. As it's been not alarming. He's been good. It's just six walks, man. Wow. Wow. <laughs> um, but yeah, the Marlins series was fine. Took two or three. Then we get the White Sox in town. Friday, Brian Wu. Brian Wu. Look at Brian Wu go. After the after the start against Texas where he gave up six earned and in two innings. He gets a good start against the Angels, and then he builds on that, and he comes out on Friday against the White Sox. He goes five and two-thirds, gives up two earned runs on three hits, no walks, and nine strikeouts. He looked great. His fastball was zipping. His secondary stuff looked really good. I was really impressed by the just the pitch sequencing, which speaks to him and, and the game plan and, and Cal's game calling because it was specifically his fastball is his best pitch, but his... his Changeup and, and slider are good, and the changeup looks good, but the slider looks like the pitch because it pairs with the fastball so well. It tunnels almost perfectly with the fastball at times. It did in that game a little bit at times where you look at the fastball, you look at a, a two-seam fastball that runs in on a right-handed hitter, and you look at a slider that runs away, glove side, from a right-handed hitter, and you throw them both in the middle at the bottom of the zone, and they'll both break in opposite directions, but same arm angle, same looking pitch for 50 feet, and then they just voom, go opposite ways. Great tunneling, just fantastic pitch tunneling, and just good stuff. Like the stuff looks like it plays in the big leagues. It's awesome. And Brian Wu looks great. It's the past two starts have looked, looked fantastic. I think I, I'm so happy with this team and their pitching development. Uh, Mariners PR tweeted after that game, the, the most strikeouts in the first career, first three career starts in Mariners history. Number one is not surprising. It's Felix Hernandez with 21 strikeouts in his first career, three career starts. Brian Wu with 20 second. And then tied for third with Eric Hansen is Bryce Miller with 18. So just good stuff. Good stuff all around from these young pitchers and just this team and the pitching development in general. It's been awesome. It's been awesome to see. And so they win. They win that game by the the skin of their teeth, three to two. And then, and then Saturday's game, the salute to the Negro Leagues Day, a Juneteenth celebration. The Seattle Steelheads jerseys are are on. They're they're rocking. They look great. And what do the Mariners do but go out? Go out and lose. Go out and lose the game in the 11th inning. And I left in the 8th inning. I had stuff to do. I saw the White Sox tied it on on a Zach Remillard hit, and I had no clue who that was. And to the 
surprise of me, I went and looked, and oh, he's making his debut, and he's three for three with a walk and two RBIs, and basically put the Mariners in their grave. That was a tough one. That was a really tough loss. They shouldn't have lost that game. After watching the highlights back, especially, I watched the first uh, seven or eight innings. Watching the highlights back was was frustrating. Uh, Julio had a good game at the plate. JP hit uh, a home run in the first on the first pitch of the game, which was sweet. Teoscar continued his, his June dominance, and they get savaged by a guy making his debut. A relatively unknown guy. Like, I am pretty plugged into baseball and would know if he was, like, a top White Sox prospect. And no, no. So they lose that game, and then they go into Sunday, Father's Day. They win pretty handedly. They win 5-1. Great game. All around good effort from everyone. Also insanely weird insanely weird game of baseball. Bryce Miller goes seven innings, six six Ks, one earned, four hits. Great start. It looks like he's bounced back from his little lull. And this is this is what I talked about earlier. When Bryce Start was Bryce Start, when Bryce Miller was dominating, he was gonna be throwing more pitches at the big league level and teams were gonna figure him out. And then for two starts there, they kinda did figure him out and he got hit around. And since then, his couple starts since then have been great. They've been He's made adjustments to the hitters who've made adjustments, and now they'll adjust back. You know, that's just how it works, and it's it's cool to watch, obviously, constant evolution uh, of a young pitcher like that, but it's good to see him bounce back after a couple rough starts and look great, look great. And he wasn't even the best pitcher in that game. The Mariners let Lance Lynn. Lance Lynn in the year of our Lord. 2023, Lance Lynn goes seven innings, and K's 16 Mariners. He gives up three runs on four hits and two walks, but K's 16. His ERA this year is over six, and it has been for a minute. Embarrassing. And, and he gets the loss, which for as much as we complain as Mariners fans about this year being disappointing, the past four years of the, like this is emblematic of this current iteration of the White Sox. Lance Lynn K 16 gives up two runs and loses the game. Just insane. That is where the White Sox are at right now. It's, it's tough sledding for them. It's tough sledding. Uh, Jared Kelnick had a really clutch uh, Blaze's clearing triple in this game. He still looks he's he's been on a bit of a slide. No one's no one's really talking about it, but he's been not alarmingly bad the past few weeks, but not great. He's king over thirty percent of the time again, which is not ideal. But uh, hopefully, just a slump. It looks like maybe he's maybe that was the breakout of it. It's an off day today, but they go to the Bronx and maybe he'll. He'll hit some some dingers onto the short porch in New York. That'd be fun. But so they take four of six in the homestand, and that's a success. They're right back at 500. They're 35 and 35, and things feel similar. They f- they f- I feel like the offense has ticked up a little bit, and the pitching has been great still. The pitching has been steadily awesome. And... The offense has felt like it's ticked up because Teoscar has been on one. He has been on one. He has been destroying the month of June. Coming in to June, he had like a 660 OPS, which is not good. And in the month of June, he's slashing 353, 3 or 431, 628. That's good for a 1.059 OPS. And that's in 14 games and uh, 58 plate appearances. That is, he's been on a hot streak. Three homers in that time. He is taking a lot more pitches at the plate. He's striking out drastically less and just looked a lot more composed and more like Teoscar Hernandez at the plate because his season numbers are just above average right now. Like he has 109 OPS plus. He's sitting at one war. He is slashing on the year uh, about a... Seven, yeah, 741 OPS, which is in the pitcher's environment we find ourselves in right now. And in these modern times, that is about 9% better than the average. Uh, he, I mean, he has 107 WRC plus. Like he's, he's now 
totality of the year a positive offensive player, just not still not exactly where he has been in his career the past couple of years, where we expect him to. But this month has been encouraging. It's been awesome to watch him on a hot streak. I, I think I either said it on a podcast a few weeks ago or tweeted it, and it's his. You gotta take him with his hot streaks. His cold streaks can be real cold, but we're seeing what he's doing when he's hitting well. He's been amazing it feels like he's had a clutch rbi knock every game the past few weeks really awesome to see another guy who's been hitting pretty well is it's this guy's year can you guess who it is can you guess who it is no it's not harrison ford it's mike ford it's the better ford it's mike motherfucking baseball large adult son baseball ford as i like to call him he's slashing 200 250 600 slugging for an 850 ops uh, four home runs in that time, 12 strikeouts and one walk since being called up in the 12 games he's played, 32 play appearances. This is exactly what I said was the best possible scenario for Mike Ford. Is he comes up and he, I, I, think, I think it was legit last week or two weeks ago, I was like, if he ends the year with, with 15 home runs and is hitting 200, that is a success. With like 100, and, 100 to 110 OPS plus, like just above average. Just above average. And that's given that they don't move for another hitter at the deadline, which they'll probably do. But he's been a pleasant surprise. I saw him at a home run in Anaheim. He had a really good week last week against the Marlins. And Mike Ford. Mike Ford. It's his year. It's his year. I totally didn't start that as a joke. I was totally in on Mike Ford. No, it's been great. It's been awesome. And when he hits a home run, it's like so effortless. I love when big boys like that hit home runs because it just looks like it looks like they don't try at all to hit home runs it's pretty fun that was the other hitter i want to touch on tail and mike ford carrying the offense julio's looked better still still a couple ticks below where we want him to be though ty's been pretty steady eugenio has noticeably been hitting the ball a lot harder the past few weeks he's just he's been getting a little bad up to which is tough but Overall, I think the offense has marginally looked better. A big reason is, is Teo and, and Julio not being, you know, 600 OPS guys like they were at the start of the year. But yeah, that that's where the team stands. 500, still kind of far back in the division, but not out of it. They'll, they'll be buyers of the deadline for sure. And I think they got to do it sooner rather than later. Uh, not only to set the trade market like Mr. Jerry D loves to do, but they got to start making up some ground. They can't keep doing this two steps forward, two steps back ordeal that they've been doing the whole year. That's why they sit at 500. They're not taking significant steps forward. They need to go on a win streak. They need to cash in that 14 game win streak that they had last year. Oh, one more thing about the last week. Our uh, Luis Arise went 0 for 12 against the Mariners. If that doesn't speak to how amazing this pitching staff, I don't know what does. Uh, that was the last notes I had from that game. But just a look, just a look at uh, the standings right now. And like I said, I think the NL Central is the most interesting division in baseball right now. The Brewers are ahead of the Reds in second place by a half game. Then the Pirates are back two and a half. The Cubs are back four, and the Cardinals are back eight and a half. And it's interesting, their Fangrass is giving the Brewers 56.3% chance to make the playoffs. And all the other teams have between 10 to 15%, which just means I don't think Zips knows exactly what to make of these teams. Because I, I think the Brewers should be the favorite. But you have, you have the Reds and the Pirates who are, are young and frisky, especially the Reds. They've won eight in a row right now up until this point. I don't know what they're doing right now in their game, but they've won eight in a row. They're young. They're frisky. They're reminding me a little bit of the Orioles of last year, potentially arriving a little ahead of schedule. And they're only a half game back of the division lead right now. Then you have the Pirates who are two and a half back, who have also the young guys and and. Uh, you know, like McCutcheon have pulled together and made that a pretty solid baseball team. Albeit they're 34 and 36 and two and a half back of the division lead. That's also what makes it interesting. Then you have the Cubs. They're four games back, 33 and 38. They invested the past couple of years through free agency and have some young guys through the ranks. And they look like an okay baseball team. 
And then you have the Cardinals, who are 29-43, and 43, almost have the worst record in baseball, or not baseball, almost have the worst record in the National League if it weren't for the Nationals and the Rockies. So they're only a couple games behind the Cardinals. And I feel like every week after the Cardinals win one, it's like, this is it. This is when they go on a run, and they haven't done that. And the fact that they're in last, and they're potentially the best team in the division, potentially, just on paper, like their pitching is kind of a mess, but their offense, on paper, is definitely the best in that division. And I think the Cardinals could still win this division. That's how bad it is. They're only eight and a half back. Like the Brewers are 37 and 34, and in first, it's, I am so excited to watch the rest of this division play out, because on the Fangrass, uh, playoff odds they also have the projected win loss of each team and right now the brewers are projected to go 83 and 79 and then every team all four of the teams after that are projected for either 77 or 78 wins all of them which is awesome which is spicy it's amazing i'm so excited and and why the nl central is also really interesting is because you have because you have these teams the brewers and the cardinals who are have proven vets on the team. Uh, they have proven to be uh, solid, solidly run teams the past couple of years, and they're they're on paper great teams. And then you have the Cubs, who are kind of in the middle ground of they have spent money and just kind of need some of the younger guys to develop right now to kind of put things together in the next couple of years. And then you have these Pirates and Reds teams who are just youth, 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 kind of killing it. And are really fun to watch because watching young baseball teams is a trip because when they win, it's just like, oh, we can win every game. Like the Reds right now are probably going into games like, oh, we can win every single game we play because all of the guys on that team are 22 and hungry to make it in the in MLB. Same with the Pirates. And then they're going against these veteran Brewers and Cardinals and kind of Cubs team. It's It's a really fun division if you can. Watch the NL Central. I think it's the most interesting division in baseball, at least up until this point in the year. It's obviously not the best division, because the AL Central is interesting too, just because the teams are close. But then you have the Royals and the Tigers, and even the White Sox. They're just bad. They're just not good. All of the all of the NL Central teams are are pretty close to 500 and very clumped. So that's my spiel on why the NL Central is. Most interesting division in baseball. And I will leave you with this. I'm I'm wrapping up here. But right now, the Mariners, according to Fangraphs, have a 24.2% chance to make the playoffs. You know, that's not that bad. That's not that bad. But they're, they're only 8.5 back as well. But the Angels and the Astros are looking... Looking solid. I hate to say the Angels are looking solid, but they're looking solid. But right now, 24.2% chance. That's not terrible. Those are not terrible odds. This team has, has done crazy things the past couple of years in spite of what the metrics say. So I wouldn't put anything past them. I think I'll do a little trade talk next week. Probably a little highlight some of the, the potential trade chips for the Mariners to ship out and uh, receive and we'll see we'll see if there's any trade movement in the next week or any rumors or if the cardinals keep going on a slide and seem like they're gonna sell 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 or we'll see we'll see but the mariners go to the uh, the al east this week they're three games set in the bronx and three against the orioles both solid baseball teams the yankees judge is out right now the last time we played him judge was great but also they got destroyed by Willie Calhoun and IKF, so if that happens again, ooh, that's that's tough. And the Orioles are just a great baseball team, so these are tough series. And then they come back home against the Nationals the following week, so if they can if they can come out of this week winners of three of the six games and then sweep the Nationals, that's a success. That's a success, but that's all I've got for you today. Thanks for listening. Greatly appreciate it. Uh, Have a good rest of your week. And of course, go Mariners.